in order that we heighten in terms of our gratitude and our appreciation to God. As the choir was singing, I was thinking about the 40th chapter of Isaiah. And I just want to read a couple of the ending verses to somewhat give a heightened uh, support to what the choir has been pointing us to in terms of our faith. Beginning at verse 25 of Isaiah 40, to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift your eyes on high and look to the heavens. Who created all these things? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, and I'm going to insert in terms of to make this more personal. Why do you say pleasant green and complain pleasant green that my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary, he doesn't get tired, and his understanding no one can fathom. You can't understand it. He gives strength to the weary, and he increases the power of the weak. Even youth grow tired and weary, and young men, they will stumble and fall, but those and they that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up and soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Let us say amen. amen. How great is our God. With your kind indulges and permission this morning before we look at a passage of scripture that is our uh, was is our responsive reading out of the gospel of John chapter 3 I uh, want to preface the message by saying that first of all I thank everybody for your prayers and your cards what you have done, the expressions of kindness, there are no words to say thank you. But since there are no words, then all I can do is say thank you. I appreciate everything. And I appreciate your prayers for the First Lady. She's sick. She has broken down trying to take care of me, cook and do everything else. And holler and fuss and try to keep me in, in uh, the right place. And uh, she has the flu, so keep her in your prayers. She's not doing too well. With that said, out of the third chapter of John's Gospel and the first three verses that we read for our responsive reading, and I'm going to be reading out of the NIV. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees. His name was Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who comes from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. I'm going to stop right there. 
those last two words that Jesus gave as a response to Nicodemus, born again. And I want you to fasten and to rivet those two words in your thoughts and carry them with you when we leave here, born again. In verse in verse 4, there is a, a reference to being born, and it's used two times in verse 4, three times in verse 5. So undoubtedly, being born again was very, was critical, and it was crucial to Jesus' response to Nicodemus. If I had been Nicodemus and Jesus had said that to me, I possibly would have responded similarly to what he did, but I would have said maybe something like, not again, not again. And Jesus' response would be, yes, again. Let's look at Nicodemus, who he was, why he came, and why Jesus said what he said to Nicodemus. We are told in terms of a composite picture of Nicodemus, he was an educated man, a scholarly man. He was born a Jew. He was a part of the race of people that God had chosen going all the way back to the Old Testament. He had been circumcised. He was also a Pharisee, and that may not make much difference to you, but in those days, a Pharisee, they, that sect, that group of individuals, they were the ruling class of God's people and of the whole region at that time. They were orthodox. They were sticklers for the law. Uh, they were formalistic. In other words, everything had to be done exactly the way the law said. And they took the law that God gave Moses and added approximately about 206 more of their laws to it, which made it an impossibility for anybody to live by all of those laws that they had written. Nicodemus was also, John tells us, he was a ruler. The implication is that not only was he a Pharisee, but he was a teacher highly respected, great reputation in the community, a part of the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin Council. We could parallel that with our Supreme Court today. They were the ruling class. Whatever, uh, uh, whatever statements that they made, whatever laws that they handed down, everybody had to abide by it. Now here is this man who has come up through the ranks of Jewish teaching. He has all of his life abided by the rules and regulations of the Mosaic Law. Here was a man who we don't know whether he saw this or whether he heard about it, but if you go back to chapter 2, or the ending of chapter 2 of the Gospel of John, it tells us that Jesus, when the Passover had come, went into the temple. And when he went into the temple, out in the courtyard, uh, they were selling, they were exchanging money. It was like... Uh, a, uh, a mall today where things were going on commercially. And we are told by John that Jesus got angry 
took some cords and planted them together and made a whip and drove everybody out of the temple and made the statement, you will not make my father's house a house of, of uh, commercial greed, and so to speak. And after he drove them out, he told them, he said, I have come to bring the sweet wine of my God's kingdom. I have come to bring a new day. I have come to bring a radical change that my father has given me the power and the authority to do. And I have, have invaded the old, the old Jewish heritage, the old Mosaic law. And I'm going to turn it around because people have been burdened like animals. They have been lashed down to observe and to live by these laws, which even you who make the law don't live by. So when we get to that third chapter, we see this man Nicodemus. And we are told that he comes to Jesus by night. There are a lot of theologians that speculate why he came by night. Some of them said that uh, Jesus would not have been as busy. He would not have been involved with a lot of crowd like he was during the day. Some of them said that uh, Nicodemus was afraid for his colleagues to see him, that it would have tarnished and blighted his reputation as a ruler and as a Pharisee. But it really doesn't matter why he came. He came. And notice now in the conversation, he says to Jesus, we know, not I know, but we know that you are a teacher recognizing Jesus as being a man of knowledge and wisdom. Now you got to remember, Jesus didn't go through the, through the uh, guidelines that uh, Nicodemus did and all the other Jewish rabbis. He was not even accepted or accredited by their Jewish teaching. He was like a rogue teacher that just came to town. But they saw something in, Nicodemus, in Jesus rather that none of them were able to do. And John uses the term miraculous signs, miracles. And Nicodemus said, we know, implying that not only him but the rest of his colleagues, we know that you are a teacher and not only just a teacher but you came from God. That's interesting, isn't it? And the reason why we can speculate that Nicodemus said we know you came from God is because nobody can do what you did except they have the power of heaven. We can't do it. I've never seen it done before. You are the first to do it. And so I am... I am enamored. I am really bewildered by what I have seen. So I want to find out more about you. In other words, how did you get this power? How did you get this authority? Then Jesus replies by telling him, the only way, and notice he didn't say many ways, but what? only way that you can enter my father's kingdom you have to be what everybody say that together you have to be what say it again what say it one more time all right now you've heard that phraseology many times you heard it before you were saved right and since you've been saved, you've heard it, right? What does born again mean? What was Jesus talking about? What was he inferring to Nicodemus? 
when he told Nicodemus you got to be born again. Then Nicodemus responded by saying, wait a minute, hold it, hold it. You mean to tell me I got to go, I'm a grown man, I'm an age teacher, a sage, and I got to go the size I am back in my mother's womb, which we know that that wouldn't fit, and to be born again? And then Jesus responded, Nicodemus, you know what? You're supposed to be a teacher. You're supposed to have knowledge and insight and wisdom. You mean to tell me you don't understand what I've said? Let me, let me see whether I can illustrate it for you, Nicodemus. You see the wind? You feel it, don't you? You feel the breeze on your cheeks and on your face. You don't know where it came from. You don't know the direction that the wind is going. In other words, the wind is a mystery. Talk about in terms of that, if the son of man, referring to himself, he makes a reference to going back to the Old Testament. You remember when Moses was given by God the laws, and you remember the children of Israel rebel, start sinning, and they were bitten by poisonous snakes. You remember that? And the folks start dying. And Moses went to God and God told Moses, make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and hold it up high. And everybody that looks to that bronze snake, they won't die. Then Jesus said, comparing himself to that, he said, if the Son of Man, what, be lifted like that bronze serpent, that it will not be just physical healing, but they will, what, have eternal life. And then you'll get to the verse in John 3, 16, for what? Say it, for God so loved Oh, I'm glad that you haven't forgotten some of your Sunday school teaching. You remember some of it. Now, let's get back to the beginning of the conversation. Nicodemus is inferring, not again. I've already been born once, not again. And Jesus' Jesus's response is yes. There are three truths that I want you to scribble write down in the margin of your Bible, on the side, or I write all, all around my Bible, the middle, the top, the bottom, the side, through the sentences everywhere. The first truth that comes out of this conversation, the word again, A-G-A-I-N, the Greek word for that word again is an-o-then, A-N-O-T-H-E-N, an-o-then. And it can refer to two things. It can refer to a process, an experience occurring, or it can refer to something that is beyond the physical, something that's supernatural. The first thing that Jesus was saying here is that a born-again experience, he was telling Nicodemus the nature of this experience, of this process, is that you must go through a radical change inwardly, not physical birth, but a spiritual birth. And that spiritual birth is just as hard, if not harder, than a physical birth. Now, the similarities is when a woman is going through childbirth, she has what? Pains, right? She goes through a lot of change. Her body changes, and, and she has to endure a lot of hardship and discomfort. But once the baby comes, she forgets about what? All of the pain, all she had to go through 
uh, in carrying the child is joy then, right? It is excitement because what? A new life has come into the world. Well, are you with me, Pleasant Green? I know I'm good to look at, but I want you to go out with me spiritually. The spiritual birth is more important than the physical birth. One can look good on the outside and be rotten and dead on the inside. In order for God to change us inside to give us a new mind, like Paul talks about in the 12th chapter of Romans, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, what? By the renewing, not of your feet, your hands, your eyes, your ears, but the renewing of what? Your mind, your thinking. And he also changes your heart. Ezekiel in the 36th chapter in the Old Testament, he alludes to this when he says that God is going to give his people a new heart and he's going to cleanse them and wash away their sins. The hardest thing for a natural man is to turn a loose control of his own life. I didn't get but one amen on that. My Lord, that's strange, isn't it? Everybody should have been saying amen. Let me repeat it and say it another way. The hardest thing for me to do now, you know, this, this doesn't apply to you. You're in great shape. But the hardest thing for me to do is to turn and loose me and give me to the Lord and tell the Lord, take over control of my life. Now, I can pretend that God is on the throne, but like in evangelism, you can surrender to Jesus and he can become your savior by saving you from hell. But the question is, after you surrender to his saviorship, have you turned or loose the control and have you given him the lordship of your life? Let me say it another way, because some of you all are sleepy this morning. If God is going to perform a miracle in me and in you, you got to let God be God. You can't tell God how you want him to do it, because not nine times out of 10, but 10 times out of 10, he ain't gonna pay you any attention because you don't know what you're talking about. Because with us being born in sin and our earthly parents were the progenitors of sin, we cannot cleanse ourselves of our sin. Case in point, ever since the, the uh, uh, disturbance in Ferguson and ever since the shooting at and the rise and the violence. I don't know whether you have been following the newscasts, but almost every weekend there has been shooting, dying. Have you noticed that? I don't care what people say about most folk are good. Good don't get you in the kingdom. You remember the rich young ruler when Jesus, he said he was good too, wasn't he? And uh, he asked him, he said, well, what, what can I do to enter to your kingdom? And he told him, get rid of your baggage. Get rid of those things that are idols in your life. And we're told that the rich young ruler couldn't, he couldn't discard all of that stuff because that stuff was good stuff to him. So he walked away from Jesus sadly. Everybody in this room this morning has got some stuff. I don't care how good we look and we're supposed to do our best, 
when we come before the Lord, give our best, physically, mentally, and spiritually. But it doesn't matter about how we address. God is concerned about how we think and the attitude of our hearts. The nature of the experience of being born again is radical. It is a dynamic transformation. Do you know that God is the only one that can change a person's heart and give them a different type of thinking, remove the selfishness, the ego, the self-righteousness, the arrogance, the blatantness. God is the only one that can remove that. Did you know that? And he's the only one that can humble us. In fact, he's the only one that can break us. How many of you have ever experienced God breaking you in your life? And God can break you in so many ways. He can take loved ones away from you and break you. He can break in terms of your health. He can break in terms of your reputation, in terms of position, jobs, all oh, a multitude of things. God can break us and bring us down to where he wants us to be. So he was telling Nicodemus, it's the nature of the experience. The next thing he was telling Nicodemus, it was the origin or the source of the experience. Where does it come from? It doesn't come from down here, because everything down here is evil, right? For the devil is the prince of this world. And even at my best and your best, when we want to think the best and do the best, at the close of the day when the evening shadows gather, there's always something we could have done and didn't do, or we did do or say or think. We should not have done, said, or think. Amen? The origin, the beginning of this new birth starts, and repeat with me, from above. From above. From above. It comes out of heaven. You remember the Lord's Prayer? Forgive me. It's not the Lord's Prayer. But the prayer that Jesus gave his disciples, the model prayer. Now see, I was just going to say whether well, somebody was going to correct me. And most of y'all just sat there and didn't say nothing. No wonder God has to be long-suffering with us. In that prayer, it starts out by saying, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on what? As it already is where? So, that prayer tells us that here where we are, things ain't right yet. Amen? Things are not the way God wants them to be. In fact, it's not going to be until the millennial age, until the end of history. That's when God is going to write and everything. That's when he's going to put Satan and chain him, and this earth will be renovated and it will become again paradise as God had meant it to be before the third chapter of Genesis. It comes from heaven. It comes by faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Then finally, not only is this born again, it is the nature of this experience, the process. Not only is it an origin, a source where it comes from, but the terms of entering God's kingdom, the steps that one must take in order to become a member of the kingdom. You cannot become a member. First, let, let me look at the, uh, the canots. Then we'll look at 
the can wheels. Is that all right? Because I was blessed to be reared in a religious home doesn't qualify me for entrance in his kingdom. Because my mother and father were saints and loved the Lord, had faith in him, doesn't qualify me for the kingdom. Somebody has been said that God doesn't have grandchildren. You know what that means? You, me, everyone, not a second generation, all of us, singularly, individually, must go through the experience of being born again. You can come to church. You can sit right next to a holy saint. You can rub shoulders with them. You can talk with them. You can hold hands with them. You can pray with them. That doesn't qualify you for entrance into his kingdom. You can talk, holy talk. You can give out religious platitudes. That doesn't qualify you for the kingdom. Let me see what else. You can do charitable things, nice things, helping things, loving things. Nothing wrong with that. But that doesn't qualify you for the kingdom. For even devils can do nice things. It depends upon the motive, why you're doing it. At least I'm getting a few smiles in there, Flint. Well, if those things don't, what does? I'm glad you asked that question. First of all, you must repent. What does repent mean? It means more than being sorry for having done wrong or said wrong or acted wrong. Like somebody said, you can be sorry for being caught or you can be sorry for being what? Approached by. But it doesn't mean you're not going to do it again. Repent means not just being sorry but it means that I realize that there is no good thing in me and that the only way that I'm going to get my life turned around, I'm going to have to put me into the hands of who? Jesus Christ. And God doesn't, he, he doesn't discriminate about your age, about your race, you can come out of a, how can I say it? You can come out of a disastrous family. Father could be a drunkard. Mother could be on drugs. Brothers and sisters could be thieves and robbers. But if by faith you trust Jesus, you can get in his kingdom. Association does not qualify you. You got to be what? Born again. Repent. Secondly, after repenting, you must confess. You must acknowledge. Well, Lord, you know, uh, I'm, 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 I know I did wrong, but... Um, my wrong is not as bad as somebody else's wrong. You remember, you know, I know so-and-so, and I know what they did, and that was just really ridiculous. I, 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 know, I, I know what I did is not as bad, but it's not as bad as what they did. Now, you know, we, we, you know, we are, how can I say it? We are good at comparing our sin with somebody else's sin. I do it, and you do it. I have to confess. As that song says, it's not my mother, father, brother, the church, my job, but it's me, O oh Lord, 
that stands in the need of prayer. I confess my sins. I confess, dear God, that you're right when you said that all have sinned and fallen short of your good. You're right, Lord. I'm in that group. I was born in that group. Please forgive me. Now, when you come to that, to that part, let, let me lift this Chester Lee around. How, how many of y'all know Chester? I remember Chester on Gunsmoke. Oh, I declare, y'all are slow this morning. Chester had a straight leg and he used to walk swinging that leg. That's what I called that Chester leg. But anyway, when, 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 when a person says, I confess my sins, I'm sorry, and I want you to make me your servant. You got to mean it in your heart. You can't pull a scam on him like men pull scams on one another. You can't go to Walgreens or Walmarts and get a green card. <laughs> Some of you laughing know what I'm talking about. That's as far as I'll go. You got to say, Lord, I need to be broken. This arrogance and this pride and uh, this egoism that I have, I, I want you to remove it because I know you can use me if I want to stay in control of my own life. And then the third thing, after you repent and confess, you acknowledge the fact that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior. You must be what? Born again. Not a physical birth. If my mother was living, and if it were humanly possible that I could go back into a womb, I would still come out the same way that I did before. I would still come out a sinner. It wouldn't change a thing. I have to be born, what, from above. God doesn't carry you up and cleanse you and then bring you back down. But when I accept his son that was sent down deliberately, purposefully, for the very fact to save my soul, and I admit that I cannot enter his kingdom. I will never see his face. I will never enter his presence unless I am born again. Mama can't help me. Daddy can't help me. Every night when I conclude my prayers, I know this might sound ridiculous to some folk or maybe naive or maybe stupid, I don't know, but it doesn't matter. I always tell the Lord, tell mama and daddy, I said hello. And I thank them for providing a spiritual atmosphere for me when I, was, when I came into this world. I thank them for walking before me as Christ wanted them to walk. I thank them for their faith, and I thank them for their trust in Jesus. Now, that didn't make me a saint, but what it did, it steered me in the right direction, and it caused me to start to think, it, well, maybe it's something to this thing called being born again. And then... When I got in college, I found out, yes, I, I, I really need Jesus because I started to see all type of crazy children in college. 
And that was an experience that I had that opened my eyes and caused me to realize you need Jesus. And maybe what Grandma said, because, and, and, and I say this to any who are here this morning that are in higher learning, and you may not have encountered this, but I know that most uh, learning institutions now, there is a lot of atheism in all of them. There are more atheistic teachers now than it was when I was coming through education. And if you're not careful, they will brainwash you. They will use twisted uh, arguments and philosophy to show you that it doesn't matter who you believe just as long as you believe in something. And that all religions are the same. Think about it. If all religions were the same, why is it that Jesus Christ is the only one that's alive and well and the rest of their founders have molded in the dust? Just think about it. There's a song that says, Jesus is what? All the world to me. He's my what? My life my joy, and my all. He is what? My strength. How long? From day to day. The Lord's Prayer said, give me this day my daily bread. You know, I ain't looking down the road five or ten years from now because I may not physically be here. The curtain might fall on me before this day leads according to man's time but I want him to give me his power from day to day why because without him what would happen to me I would fall when I'm sad what does he do oh yes and what is he to me he's a friend he's a mother father brother He's a companion, he's a teacher, he's an instructor, he's strength, he's joy, he's compassion, he's grace, he's mercy. You can go on and on and on. And I'm saying that to say this, that he's everything that we need. How many of you know that Jesus is everything that, that you need in your life? How many of you know it? by experience, not by what I told you as a pastor, not by what somebody else has told you, but do you know personally, individually, that Jesus is all the world to you? Oh, uh, now, let, 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 let me get back to grandma's religion now. How do you know he's all the world to you? not only because what he's been, but what he still is to me. What he keeps on doing day in and day out. When I am irritable and crossed and vexed in my spirit, what does he do? He calms me. He settles me down. And it's all right for individuals to encourage me on the outside, but inevitably, I need something on the inside. I can hear a lot of things through my ears, but it may not, and others have heard me say this, you know, there's a problem many times for all of us between what we hear and what we receive here. Sometimes the pipe from here to here gets stopped up, and it doesn't go all the way down. But, when you accept to the fullest Jesus Christ, you know that he's joy. All you have to do, let your mind go back. Let your mind flash back. Has there ever been a situation that he brought you through, that he brought you out? 
Keep on thinking. Was there ever a time in the past that things got so rough and became so cloudy and so jumbled and confused to you that you felt like just throwing up your hands and saying it ain't worth it and before you knew it, uh, the dark clouds lifted. The sun, the shafts of the sun cut through the dark clouds. And then you were reminded by the Holy Spirit, he lived. Oh, yes, he lives. How do you know he lives? Because he lives within my soul. I might just hop up and start to doing a chest on that. I heard somebody say the other day, I love him. Why do you love him? I love him because first of all, he's God. He's good. He's kind. And look all that he did for me. He sent his son, spotless, no sin, and let him die on a cross. Let evil men spit on him, lie on him, trap him. And they knew that they were wrong. And he knew he had the power to get out of their clutches, but he submitted to it. Even on that cross, he could have called legions of angels and they would have come to his behest. But instead, uh, he became gentle like a lamb led to the slaughter. And like Grandma said, he died. Don't you know he died? He died. Oh, he died. He died one day, but he just didn't die because everybody dies. And like he told the thief that was that was on his right. He said, this day you shall be with me in paradise, in my kingdom, eternal life, life everlasting. But he ain't dead. He ain't in the grave no more. How do you know, preacher? Because he got up three days later. Now Nicodemus was saying, we see, we've seen you perform miracles. Nicodemus didn't see nothing until when Jesus predicted, bury me, I'll get up in three days like Jonah. I will, like this temple here, will be destroyed in three days. I will be raised up in three days. They didn't believe him, but what happened? Did he get up? 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 Up! He got up. All oh, power. Yes. All oh, power. You must be born again. Spiritual birth from heaven process that God carries us through to cleanse us on the inside to make us what? Whole again. And then not only does he wash away our sins, but look what else he does to make certain that we don't forget his abiding presence. He gives us the presence of the Holy Spirit Ain't that good news? Reminded of that song. Ain't that good news? Somebody here this morning, I'm not talking about the crowd. I'm not talking about where you're seated. I don't care whether you are sitting next to a saint. That makes no difference. If you don't know Jesus, you can sit right there and die tomorrow and go to hell. It's just that simple. There's somebody here this morning that's unchurched too. You don't know Jesus. Oh, 
there was a time in the past years ago uh, when you went through an episode that you found yourself being contrite in your heart and you wanted to surrender but then you decided I'll wait I'll do it later and Satan has been telling you just wait do it later you don't need to do it now you you got plenty of time you young you don't need to be strapped down by being a religious person you don't have to be tied down where you can't go to the bars where you can't do your dancing your drinking your carousing that's all right wait until you're about in your 50s or 60s and after you sown your wild oats and you get it all out of your system. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. That's the reason why you're quiet, because it hurts. And you see, I'm honest enough to admit that I went through that transition in my life. And I said I'll wait until I get older. I got a whole lot of time. But then the Holy Spirit kept pricking on me, kept cutting me kept stabbing my heart kept jabbing me and I tried to ignore it I tried to resist it but finally after a class a, a, a classmaclitic event I said Lord if this is you I want you to make yourself known to me I want to know that you're speaking to my heart I want to know that this is the way that you want me to go. God will make his presence known in your life. The choir is going to lead us in an invitational song. Really, there's no such a thing as an invitational song as such. All songs are geared around Jesus but they're going to lead us in a song that we use for an invitation. And I want everybody now in a spirit of reverence and respect. I want you to bow your head, please. Please bow your head. Close your eyes. And if you know of someone in your family that's unsaved, on church.